This weekend, as we wrap up our look at the life of Barnabas called Next Steps with Jesus, we're asking the question, how are disciples of Jesus expected to share? Because let's admit it, sharing's not always easy. I get reminded of that fact every time my wife Tammy wants to use our family Jeep. The Jeep is our Jeep. You see, we own two vehicles. One of them is a Jeep Wrangler. The Jeep is our Jeep. And yet, I use the Jeep just about every day. So while I recognize that the Jeep is our Jeep, I also know that the Jeep is my Jeep. And that means that every time my wife tells me I need to use the Jeep today, the first question that comes to my mind is why? (laughs) Followed by the next question, which is, and when are you going to bring it back to me? Because the Jeep is my Jeep. Because sharing is not easy. Now, Barnabas shared life and ministry with a guy named Saul. When we meet Saul in the book of Acts, he's a persecutor of the church. But then after Saul became a disciple of Jesus himself, he wanted to become a part of the church in Jerusalem that he had persecuted. And it was Barnabas who welcomed Saul into the church in Jerusalem when no one else would. When Barnabas was in the city of Antioch leading brand new followers of Jesus there, Barnabas was the one who thought, I will give Saul a chance. I need the help of Saul. And he brought Saul to Antioch to help train these new disciples of Jesus. Barnabas took Saul along on his first missionary journey, and it was on that first missionary journey that Saul found his voice. It was on the island of Cyprus, and Saul got involved in a power confrontation with a Jewish sorcerer, and the Spirit of God rose up in him and did miraculous things through him, and Saul spoke the good news about Jesus boldly and clearly. And that's the point at which Saul instead began going by his Roman name, Paul. And from that point forward, the New Testament no longer refers to Barnabas and Saul, but instead begins referring to them as Paul and Barnabas. The disciple maker became the assistant. Barnabas and Paul the apostle, did life and ministry together. Barnabas also shared life and ministry with someone named John Mark. John Mark was Barnabas's cousin, his close relative, and his name, John, would be the Hebrew name that he used in his family, and Mark would be his Greek or Roman name that he used in public. And Barnabas took John Mark also along on that first missionary journey. Barnabas saw in John Mark great potential to be a disciple maker, and and they worked together on the island of Cyprus. But when Paul and Barnabas left Cyprus and went to the southern coast of Asia Minor, John Mark decided to go home to Jerusalem. He left the team, and he left Paul a little disappointed and not able to understand what had happened. Years later, that event led to a conflict that for a time meant that Barnabas and Paul could not do life and ministry together. And we read about this in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41, which say, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of God and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement. Disagreement. 
so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. You see, sharing, even life and ministry, for two followers of Jesus is not always easy, but disciples of Jesus are expected to share. And so we are going to look at the life of Barnabas one last time today, and as we do so, we're going to see how he resolutely kept taking next steps in sharing with Jesus. And as we do so, we're going to see through the life of Barnabas that sharing and making and multiplying disciples are all closely related. So we dig in one more time today to the life of Barnabas. And what we realize is that Barnabas was a master disciple maker. In fact, disciple-making was at the core of the conflict between Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul had both decided to go on a second missionary journey, but Barnabas wanted to take John Mark again, and Paul was resolute in his opposition to this step. Barnabas could see in John Mark the potential to become a truly catalytic disciple-maker, and Barnabas was one who was in the habit of giving people second chances, just as he had done with Paul back when he was called Saul. And so the Bible says there was a sharp disagreement between the two of them. That's Bible speak, for things got hot between the two of them. And they split ways, but I want you to see not the conflict, but the reason why Barnabas stuck stuck to his position, he wanted to help John Mark become the disciple maker he knew John Mark could be. And as you look at this conflict between Barnabas and Paul, what I want you to see too is that where there was one mission trip, now there are two. The Bible says that Paul went ahead on this mission trip that he was planning. He took Silas instead and a team that continued to grow he went northward from Antioch into Asia Minor, and he continued north again from the territory he and Barnabas had worked in on their first missionary journey. He came to the shores of northern Asia Minor, and he crossed into Europe, and he worked in Greece before coming back to the western parts of Asia Minor. He planted churches, made disciples. It was an historic mission trip. Barnabas took John Mark, and he too went on a second missionary journey. He went to the island of Cyprus. But we don't get to hear the details of Barnabas' second missionary journey because Acts changes to following the apostle Paul from that point forward. But what I want you to see is that where there was one mission trip planned of making and multiplying disciples, in its place there were now two mission trips, where people were making and multiplying disciples of Jesus. The Bible indicates that Barnabas and Paul eventually reconciled their relationship. Paul writes about Barnabas, and he mentions him favorably in a later letter in the New Testament. I also want you to know that Barnabas did raise up John Mark to become a truly catalytic disciple maker. In fact, John Mark proved his worth to Paul, who had been his biggest critic. Paul mentions him in the book of Colossians, where he writes in chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him, and Jesus, who is called Justice. This is who. Then Paul goes on to say what? These are the only men of the circumcision, that is, these are the only Jewish workers among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Paul comes to see the value of John Mark. Paul isn't the only one, though. The great apostle Peter had an even closer relationship with John Mark. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter mentions him and calls him, Mark, my son. And John Mark, so esteemed and valued by Peter, 
goes on to be the one that tradition says wrote what we have in our New Testaments as the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to John Mark. And what we see in the end is that Barnabas was a master disciple maker. He's the one who trained and sponsored Paul, who was truly catalytic in his ministry. He is the one who trained and sponsored John Mark and Barnabas made and multiplied disciples himself over and over again. Barnabas was a master disciple maker. But as we try to see now the link between making disciples, multiplying disciples, and sharing, there are four things that I need you to remember today. The first thing that I want you to remember is that all Christians are disciples, okay? And this is the part where sometimes we get the impression that there are Christians and then there's a special category of Christians called disciples. Sometimes when we hear the word disciple, we associate that with the 12 people Jesus called to follow him in Galilee. And that is true. They are referred to as his disciples. But the word disciple simply means student or learner. A disciple is a student or a learner of Jesus. And the Bible says that all of those who belong to Jesus, all Christians, are disciples, which means if you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a disciple. And you say, wait, what, me? A disciple? No, I'm not a disciple. Yes, if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. And you say, no, I'm not a disciple. I'm just a Christian. A disciple is a special Christian. No. If you are a Christian, you are a disciple. I would love it if you all said, I am a disciple. That's not who you are, so I'm not going to ask you to do that. But if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. All Christians are disciples. Secondly, all disciples make disciples. Now, bluntly, some disciples are better at making disciples than others. But all disciples make disciples disciples, which leads us to the third thing, which is that making disciples is not a project. Making disciples is usually a process. Occasionally, it'll happen that you can meet a person, you can share your faith in Christ with them, they decide to become a Christian right there and begin leaning on you to help them grow as a disciple of Jesus. But normally, what happens We build a relationship with someone. We do life together. And in the context of doing life together, we share the good things that God has done with us, and that person eventually wants to become a disciple of Jesus themselves. And in that relationship, we help them to learn, to thrive, and to grow. Making disciples is not something that you can check off a list. It's not a special project. It's not... It's not a one-in-time kind of thing. Making disciples instead is a process. Finally, making disciples is best thought of as sharing. Making disciples is best thought of as sharing. Instead of thinking of it as a one point in time, we come to understand that making disciples is simply sharing the good things that God has put in our lives with another person. And when I think about making disciples this way, it takes my anxiety level down about the whole process so much because I realize what I am doing for another person is not doing something to them. I am simply sharing what God has done in my life. I'm sharing my story. I'm sharing the collected wisdom that I've gained over the years. I'm sharing what God has done in my life. In an important sense, the way that I think about it is My life is like a bowl that holds a a stash of gold coins that God has put in that bowl that is my life. And I have the opportunity to take gold coins, things of great value, out of the bowl that is my life and put them in the bowl that is someone else's life. And there's no anxiety that all my gold coins are going to be gone because as I take gold coins out of here and put them into someone else's life, God keeps filling up the bowl that is my life. Making disciples is best thought of as sharing. It's a great kind of sharing to do. There are three things that disciple makers share. The first thing that we share, disciple makers share their stories. 
Now, on your own, if you're thinking about sharing your story, then you are worried about your story. You, you feel a need to protect your story. You don't want to share the truth about your life. You don't want to share your brokenness because you are afraid of being judged. But when you realize that all you're doing is just sharing your story with someone else, then you recognize there's nothing to be feared. You share your story naturally because this is who you are. And you share the good and the bad, and you share how God has taken all of those things and redeemed them in Christ. That's just a natural thing to do, is to share your story with another. Disciple makers also share God's story. Now, I understand when you think of God's story as being like a script that a telemarketer runs, then you get a little anxious about doing that because you know what happens when the telemarketer calls you. You pick up the phone, it's an 800 number, you hear the computer voice and you hit click and you worry that that's what's going to happen when you begin to share God's story with someone else. And that is if it's a telemarketer script because nobody wants to hear that. But if God's story is the story of what God has done in your life and in your world, if God is the treasure has changed your life, then sharing that with someone else becomes completely natural and authentic. They want to hear. They're naturally curious about what God has done in your life. So disciple makers share their stories, God's story, and their lives. Disciple makers share their lives. You see, disciple makers naturally open up their lives and say, God has put good things in my life, and I want to give the good things, the the good story, the good wisdom, the good work, the good power that God has put in my life. I want to share that with you. I want to share my time with you. I want to share my life with you. Disciple makers share their lives. I have had the opportunity to make a, a friend who is a Muslim who has helped me to understand even better what it looks like to share life together. Now, now, we're beginning to get to know one another, and we are beginning to do things together. And I love this relationship because we're, we're so very honest with one another. He tells me blatantly, he says, I want to convert you to Islam. And I say, that's awesome. I want to convert you to Christianity. Let's talk. So we get to talk. And, and he wants to share everything. He wants to talk. He wants to share his life with me and have me share my life with him. He wants to talk about what he believes, and he wants me to talk about what I believe. Because you see, in his culture, all of that's so very natural. And in my culture, that is difficult to do. And he is teaching me how important it is for me to share, because if he's ever going to become a disciple of Jesus, then I'm going to have to share my story and God's story and my time and maybe even my Jeep with him. (laughs) I want to share with you today, though, five reasons why sharing is a foundational habit for Jesus' disciples. First, it's because sharing is God's nature. The Bible tells us that eternally, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. God is one being and three persons, which means Father and Son and Holy Spirit always have one another. They share life together. And you say, isn't that just love? And the answer is yes. Sharing is love in action. And sharing, it turns out, is in God's eternal nature. Sharing is also God's plan. You see, in eternity, God decided to share by giving cosmos existence, by giving you and me life. But in eternity, God recognized that in creating the cosmos and in creating you and me, we would rebel. And so in eternity, God decided to give his life to save us. And in deciding to save us, in deciding to give us eternal life at the end, God is deciding to share eternity with us. 
So sharing is not only God's nature, but it's God's plan. It turns out, too, that sharing is Jesus' way. In my own devotional, I'm working through the gospel according to Matthew right now, and I find Jesus on two separate occasions sharing blessing with children. Children come to him, and everyone is scandalized by it, and Jesus says, let these little children come to me, and he shares the blessing of God with them because that is just Jesus' way. Jesus shares the wisdom of God with the crowds and with his disciples. Jesus shares the power of God as he heals the sick, the blind, and the lame. Jesus shares freedom with the prisoners and and with those who are caught in demon possession. Jesus shares life and new life and eternal life with us. Sharing is Jesus' way. But on top of that, sharing is Jesus' invitation to you and me. Because you see, Jesus calls us to be his disciples. And when he calls his first disciples, he makes very clear what that call involves. In Mark chapter 1, verse 17, we read about Jesus calling disciples. And what he says is, follow me. Come and share my life with me. Learn my ways and accept my life as your life. But then he goes on to say, and I will make you become fishers of men. Meaning if you become my disciples, then I invite you not only to share my life, but I invite you to share your life. I invite you to make more disciples of me. That's what Jesus is inviting us to. But this invitation that he gives at the beginning becomes a command at the end. Sharing, as it turns out, is not only Jesus' invitation, but Jesus' command as well. As he gives his great commission to his disciples, to the church, as he is preparing to return to heaven in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus gives this command. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go is not the command. He knows that we're going to go. The command is to make disciples. The command is not to be disciples. He doesn't say, go therefore and be disciples of all nations. That doesn't even make sense. What he says is, go therefore, as you are going, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Sharing our lives and making and multiplying disciples is Jesus' command. So I want to suggest to you today three next steps that you can take in sharing. Step number one is pray for one lost person you know to come to faith in Jesus. And this is the step that you take if you are not active in making and multiplying disciples right now. What you do is you begin by praying for one lost person you know. This is someone where you live and work and play. And you pray. And you ask God to help that person come to faith in Jesus. In fact, I would say, here's the bold prayer for you to pray. Pray, God, send someone into this person's life so that they will become a disciple of Jesus. And watch, the person that he sends into their lives is probably going to be you. So step one is just pray for one lost person to come to faith and be a disciple of Jesus. Now, if you've been doing that, then step two may be to decide to live the blessed lifestyle. Decide to live the blessed lifestyle. That's pulling all of the pieces together. Bless, you see, is an acronym, and it describes the process of sharing our lives and of making and multiplying disciples of Jesus. The letter B stands for step one, begin with prayer. The letter L stands for listen, listen with care. E reminds us to Eat together, which is important. Spend time together. The first S says serve with love. And the second S, that's where we share your story. Share your story. So B-L-E-S-S. And there are resources on our website to help you understand the blessed lifestyle better and to take each one of these steps yourself. Your decision may be to live the blessed lifestyle. And I want you to understand today that living this blessed lifestyle is not nearly as difficult as you think. Now, some of you smelled 
making and multiplying disciples up at the beginning today when I began. And right from the beginning, some of you were like, nope, turning the brain off. I'm going to sit here and listen until they get up and sing the next song. Because you've decided already, I'm not going to share, I am not going to share my faith, I am not going to make and multiply disciples. Why? Because it's difficult. And because it makes us vulnerable and we feel like we're going to be rejected. But what I want you to see is that living the blessed lifestyle is not difficult. It's not unapproachable. When you begin by praying for lost people, and you listen with care as people tell the stories of their lives. And you open your life to eat together, to spend time together. You serve people with care. It is just natural that you're going to have the opportunity to share your story, God's story, and what faith in Jesus looks like. And when you get here, you don't have to have a script memorized with every detail right and perfect. You talk about what God has done in your life, and you leave the balance to God the Holy Spirit, who says, I will give you the words when you're in that context, and I will take the words you say, and I will make them be exactly what they need to be. Living the blessed lifestyle is one of the greatest joys of my life. And trust me, it's easy. But if you're living the blessed lifestyle, there's still a next step that you may take. And that is number three, decide now to go on a mission trip in the next 12 months. You see, when we go on a mission trip, we go to another place where there are not as many disciples of Jesus, and we share what God has done in our lives. One of the beautiful things about a mission trip is as you're preparing for a mission trip, you get all the tools that you need to share, and then you go to another place to do your sharing. And, and the amazing thing about going to another place is all of a sudden you are not constrained by the fear that you have in your own home. Town. You go to another place and you can share freely without any fear of judgment who you are and what God has done in your life. I have been on multiple, multiple mission trips in my life, and it is one of the greatest joys that you can have. I encourage you to consider going on a mission trip in the next 12 months. Now, Barnabas took one next step after another. He did all of these kinds of things himself. Barnabas began by taking the next step of becoming a disciple of Jesus. He took the next step of joining the church in Jerusalem. He, he took the next step of seeing the needs of the people around him. And then he took the next step of taking a, a field that he owned, a, a piece of property, and selling it and taking the proceeds from that sale and giving them to the church so that the church could use that money to meet the needs of the people in the church. He took the next step of going on a mission trip, and then he took the next step of leading a church, and then he took the next step of investing himself in the life of a controversial figure named Saul. He took the next step of going on a great missionary journey with Paul, the next step of investing his life in John Mark. He made and multiplied disciples in Jerusalem, in Antioch, on Cyprus, and in Asia Minor. And that's where the trail of Barnabas' life goes cold in the New Testament. We don't have any details after that. But what we see is that Barnabas took one next step after another. And as he did, he impacted the world for Christ in dramatic ways. Barnabas encouraged the church in Jerusalem. He built the church in Antioch. He gave us Paul, who made disciples around the world and wrote significant parts of our New Testament. He gave us John Mark, who helped Paul and who helped Peter, who made and multiplied disciples himself and gave us the gospel according to Mark. We have disciples and churches on Cyprus and in Asia Minor. 
Barnabas impacted the world for Christ. It's all because he took one next step with Jesus after another. What is your next step with Jesus? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, a Christian, then becoming a Christian is your first next step with Jesus. If you have yet to wrap your mind around the fact that as a Christian you are a disciple of Jesus, then understanding that you are a disciple may be your next step. But today what I'm really hoping is that you will recognize that as disciples of Jesus, it falls to us to share, to share the gospel, to share the good things, to share our lives so that we can make and multiply disciples of Jesus ourselves. One next step after another even when they're small, add up to become something truly significant in time. I encourage you, take your next step with Jesus and watch how God will impact the world for Christ.